All right, let's tear down some governments in Epic History TV's 1848, Europe's Year of Revolutions. Um, if you want to hear my video just completely slandering the historical popular generals, I will put the link up top and uh, you can go over there and watch it. It's a little bit rough and I am a little bit out of my mind while I'm doing it. However, um, it was a lot of fun to do and it's got some funny stuff in it. So if you want to watch it, go over there and watch it. But I'm really excited to get into it. Epic History TV does great and this is a really interesting time period. So let's jump into it. Europe's Year of Revolutions. 1848. More than three decades after his defeat, the shadow of Napoleon Bonaparte and the French Revolution still looms over Europe. The peace settlement of 1815 had been a triumph for reactionary forces. That dickhead Alexander, over there acting all important. Europe's great powers, Britain, France, Austria, Prussia and Russia, were committed to working together to ensure no more revolutions. Radicalism and republicanism would not be allowed to disturb the peace of Europe again. Austrian Chancellor Prince Clemens von Metternich is regarded as the architect of this new conservative order. Some historians call it the Metternich system. And yet, across Europe, there are many for whom the ideals of the French Revolution remain not a nightmare, but an inspiration. Liberals seek personal freedoms and civil rights, such as equality before the law, protected by constitutions, a free press, and regular elections. Nationalists share these aims with a desire in Italy and Germany for national unification, or in the multi-ethnic Austrian Empire for greater recognition, autonomy, and respect for language. Poles continue to seek the restoration of an independent Poland, and have launched one bloody uprising against the Russians in 1830. Their cause is supported by Liberals across Europe. In most countries, Liberals and Nationalists face draconian censorship laws, arrest by the secret police, and bans on political parties and meetings. Yeah, and Russia's kind of in a weird spot here because not only do they have this going on in Poland, but obviously the same kind of pushes are happening in Russia proper. So, uh, yeah, they're they're in a little bit of a, a tough spot here. And there's a breakdown here between the countries that are formed out of multi-ethnic groups and then the lack of countries and more just the regions that have all the same ethnic groups there. And so you see this push of like quote unquote nationalism in, in different ways playing out here, where in a place like the Austrian Empire, they're not necessarily trying to form some major country. The major country already exists. They want autonomy inside their, their system. On the other side, you have obviously the, the German states that they don't have a major, you know, all ethnic German country there and they're, they're pushing for it. And so you see these, even though people have the same general idea of what they want, depending on where they are and, and what their situation is, they they kind of are having to go about different ways of getting it. But there are always loopholes. In France, private banquets turn into political rallies. In Italy, scientific societies discuss politics, while gymnastic groups do the same in Germany. These liberal movements are dominated by the middle class, with their own local and national agendas but also many shared values and aims. They are passionate, organized, and waiting for their opportunity.
but it is. Yeah, and there are multiple statesmen, politicians, uh, oligarchs, for lack of a better term, who are seeing this start to. You know, it's none of them really know what exactly it is. They they don't know what exactly is happening. But they certainly feel that the winds are starting to change on politics and the way that people feel all around Europe. You know, Otto von Bismarck has that quote after he's traveled around Europe where he's like, "Man, you know, things things are are definitely going in a different direction here." It isn't just the middle classes that want change. By 1848, rising populations and food prices had created hunger, poverty and social unrest across Europe. Low wages and hunger drive peasants to cities in increasing numbers, where they become cheap labour to feed the growing pace of industrialisation. They live in slums and work long hours in dreadful conditions if they can find work. Violent protests by workers and peasants are on the rise. Harvest failures and potato blight make a bad situation worse, with a deadly famine in Ireland and food riots across France. In the face of such crises, Europe's governments offer little support or hope of reform. When French Prime Minister François Guizot is challenged that only the richest half percent could vote in France, he merely replies, Enrichissez-vous, get rich. In the winter of 1847-48, a sharp economic downturn throws thousands more out of work. The case for reform is more urgent than ever, but Europe's governments fail to act. The stage is set for a European revolution. In southern Italy, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies is ruled by Spanish Bourbon King Ferdinand II. His disastrous agrarian reforms have united Sicilian landowners and peasants against him. His kingdom will witness 1848's first revolution. In Sicily, furious crowds chase Bourbon troops out of Palermo, and the island declares independence, re-adopting its liberal constitution of 1812. Revolutionary fervour spreads to the mainland. Mass rallies in Naples force King Ferdinand to issue his own constitution. In Piedmont, Sardinia, the threat of revolution persuades King Carlo Alberto to grant a constitution, and there are celebrations in the streets of Turin. Across the border, in Austrian-ruled Lombardy, Venetia, Italian nationalists revolt in Milan and Venice, and drive out the Austrian garrisons. But as dramatic as these events are, they're about to be eclipsed by news from Paris. It's always the French. It's it's always the French. They they can freaking they can protest and revolt like nobody ever. And at the drop of a hat. Since France's 1830 July Revolution, the country has been ruled by Louis-Philippe, the so-called Citizen King. He's a more moderate figure than his Bourbon predecessor, Charles X, but he opposes further reform, despite the growing economic crisis. <laughs> his Prime Minister, François Guizot, is hated. When he bans the banquets that are really opposition rallies, Angry crowds march through Paris, chanting, Down with Guizot! Long live reform! Guizot resigns, but it is not enough. Nervous troops fire on the crowds. 52 civilians are killed. Louis-Philippe loses control of the capital, and as the mob advances on the Tuileries Palace, he abdicates 
and flees to England. A new provisional government is formed, and from the Hôtel de Ville, new Foreign Minister Alphonse de Lamartine announces, the Republic has been proclaimed. France's monarchy has fallen in just three days. To be fair, he did not want to end up like Louis there. So it's it's a little bit understandable why he got out of Dodge as quickly as he did. He wanted to keep his head, I get it. The news is carried across Europe by the new telegraph system. The effect is electrifying. <laughs> 75-year-old Austrian Chancellor Prince Metternich is among the first to be informed of the revolution in Paris. His police chief assures him there's no chance of such a thing happening in Vienna. But on the 13th of March, around 4,000 students, inspired by the news from Paris, march on the Landhaus, the assembly building, and force their way in. There's a confrontation with troops who open fire and kill four. Vienna's workers side with the students. Much of the crowd's hostility is directed at Metternich. When the State Council suggests he resign, Metternich meekly agrees and heads into exile in England. One of the most extraordinary political careers in Europe's history, spanning 40 years, comes to an end. Emperor Ferdinand suffers from epilepsy and a speech impediment, and is a largely passive figure. But when his council announces there will be elections for an assembly that will draft a constitution, crowds cheer him in the street. The secret police disappear, censorship is ignored, the people of Vienna celebrate. Nationalists within the Austrian Empire are also inspired by events. In the Hungarian parliament, politician Lajos Kossuth makes a fiery speech denouncing Habsburg absolutism as the pestilential air which dulls our nerves and paralyzes our spirit. His speech is printed and circulated widely, inspiring others across the empire. Hungarians launch their own revolution, with 12 demands that include greater autonomy, a free press and parliamentary reform. Czech liberals in Prague form a national committee and also send their demands to Vienna. There is even a Romanian nationalist uprising in the Ottoman province of Wallachia, forcing the abdication of the local prince. Across the smaller states of Germany, rulers face popular demands for reform. Most quickly grant concessions to avoid losing their thrones. The black, red and gold tricolour, symbol of a united Germany, is prominent among the crowds. Germany's first ever National Assembly meets in Frankfurt, with elected delegates from across Germany. They debate how they will achieve the liberal dream of a unified Germany, and begin drafting its national constitution. In the Prussian capital, Berlin, students and liberals are thrilled by developments and celebrate Metternich's fall. King Frederick William IV promises reform, but also moves extra troops into the city. Tensions escalate between Berliners and soldiers, and on the 18th of March, protesters erect barricades. The army attacks, leading to vicious fighting in the streets. 800 protesters are killed. The king loses his stomach for the slaughter and withdraws troops from the city, promising a new constitution. <laughs> Not all Europe is embracing change. In Russia, Emperor Nicholas firmly opposes any reforms. He'd been badly shaken by the Decembrist revolt on the opening day of his reign. Since then, he has tightened censorship, 
and created a new secret police unit, the Third Department. There is a crackdown on all suspected subversives. Writer Fyodor Dostoevsky is among those arrested and subjected to a mock execution before he is exiled to Siberia. There will be no concessions in Russia. By European standards... What's interesting here is these things can go a lot of different directions. Obviously, you see that with the terrors in France, with the initial revolution. These things can go bad very quickly. And so it's, it's interesting that there's at least some level of stability through a lot of this where you're not having crowns completely abdicate. The, the hierarchy in most places is staying in place. They're kind of just moving power a little bit. But on the other side, Russia obviously is handling it completely differently. Well, what happens? Eventually, it gets to the point where all of these countries, they don't necessarily have the stomach to use their soldiers in the way that they would really have to use them to put down these types of revolts, right? Where they would just go in and basically slaughter everybody. A lot of them don't have the stomach to do that. But what ends up happening in Russia is they lose that ability. Because it's, it goes on for so long and every, you know, the, the cries of the populace are not heard for so long that eventually the military itself will turn on the crown. And at that point, you, you no longer even have that capability. Even if you want to go in and crush it, you, you can't. You, you've lost your, your sword arm. Britain is already a liberal constitutional monarchy, and the middle classes broadly accept the status quo. But there is a popular movement calling for more democratic reforms. They're known as the Chartists, for the six-point charter they wish to implement. A mass rally is organised for the 10th of April in London. This is a photograph of that meeting. The authorities fear violence, and draft in 80,000 extra police. But the event passes off peacefully. In the Netherlands, King William II backs a new constitution and reforms, successfully preempting any revolutionary disturbance. With fortuitous timing, Frederick VII of Denmark had abolished royal absolutism in January, so also avoids revolution. But he faces a German nationalist revolt in Schleswig-Holstein, which leads to war with the German Confederation. Denmark will ultimately prevail in this war, thanks to diplomatic support from the other European powers. Yeah, but that's not the end of that story, and it's going to come back to it's going to come back to play a role later on. In 1848. Polish hopes were high that these revolutions would pave the way for the restoration of an independent Poland. Europe's liberals, after all, had frequently expressed enthusiasm for the idea. But in reality, no major power is willing to risk confrontation with Russia for the sake of the Poles. A Polish rising in Posen is put down by the Prussians, while the Austrians deal with risings in Krakow and Galicia. The first euphoric phase of the European revolutions becomes known as the Springtime of the Peoples. With censorship relaxed, there's an explosion in the number of newspapers, among them Cologne's radical new daily, Neue Rheinische Zeitung, edited by Karl Marx. It feels I swear I know that name from somewhere. Like the dawn of a new era. But these early successes are built on the back of an uneasy alliance, as Marx is quick to highlight. Middle-class liberals want constitutions, more inclusion in politics, and a free press. Workers, who are the revolutionary foot soldiers in many cities, want cheaper food and the right to work. 
Yep, and you see this with the initial, uh, oh golly, what is it? The initial Russian Revolution in 19... I'm blanking. It's right at the beginning of the 1900s. The one that's put down. You see this this happen. The Tsar basically placates the liberals and crushes the workers. And then goes back on what he had told the liberals. And so he promises the liberals a constitution. He completely smashes the workers... The liberals are getting what they want, so they're, you know, they don't they don't care. Then once the workers are smashed, he goes back to the liberals and says, Oh yeah, by the way, that whole Duma and all that, I actually don't have to listen to you. You all suck, like that sort of thing. You see this this uneasy alliance, you know. They're they are mutual, they're after the same thing theoretically. Right? They're they're in general, they they what they want kind of bump into each other. However, they're two totally different classes of people, and that's where kind of the rub is, and that's where this like idea of you know class warfare. Obviously, Karl Marx is he's all about this, right? German radicals sum it up with a neat pun: freedom to read versus freedom to feed. Europe's new assemblies are under pressure from conservatives who think they're going too far and radicals and socialists who think they're not going far enough. Most horrifying of all to Europe's middle class, there hovers the threat of mass direct action, social revolution, the mob. In the wake of the revolution, France's provisional government had set up National Workshops, a public works programme to alleviate unemployment in Paris. But just three months later, a new, more conservative government announces their closure. 100,000 workers are suddenly jobless. The response is immediate and furious. I'm telling you, the, the French will revolt nonstop. They'll do it at the drop of a hat. They barely need an excuse to get out in the streets and start marching. Over three days in June, Paris radicals take on the middle class National Guard and regular troops in a bloody battle of the barricades. The Archbishop of Paris attempts to mediate, but is cut down in a crossfire. This remarkable early photograph shows some of the Paris barricades fought over that summer. By the time it's all over, General Cavagnac's troops have killed at least 1,500 workers and arrest 12,000 more, a third of whom are deported to Algeria. He believes he has saved France from anarchy. The sacred cause of the Republic has triumphed, he declares. The French Revolution. I don't think the workers would agree with that statement. Revolution has split between left and right, with bloody consequences. It paves the way for the return of. That's not totally true. In in for general European left and right, the conservatives in Europe still very much believe in the power of the monarchy. So this is not the the general. You know, it's, it's, uh, if you are for a republic, you are already way further to the left than a lot of European conservatives at this time. So it's not technically wrong, but there's a, there's a little bit of a difference there. Saying that this fight is between left and right is a, it's a little bit of a simplicity of a famous name from the past, promising unity and order. This freaking guy. That spring, conservative governments had been caught off guard by the speed of events. Now they begin to fight back. 
In Prague, Czech students clash with troops. The wife of Austrian commander General Windisch Greitz is killed by a stray bullet. He responds by withdrawing his troops and bombarding the city's old town with artillery. 43 are killed before the students surrender. In Italy, King Carlo Alberto of Piemont Sardinia has declared an Italian war of liberation against Austria and invades Lombardy Venetia. He is supported by the other Italian states and nationalist volunteers, including the Italian Legion, led by professional revolutionary Giuseppe Garibaldi. Austrian forces in Italy are commanded by 81-year-old Field Marshal Radetzky, a distinguished veteran of the Napoleonic Wars. Vienna orders him to negotiate. Instead, Radetzky wages a masterful campaign, fending off the Piedmontese advance, then launching a decisive counterattack. Piedmontese forces retreat in disarray, and Carlo Alberto negotiates a truce. That summer, Johann Strauss composes the Radetzky March to celebrate the old general's victory. Meanwhile, Austrian relations with Hungary are in crisis. The country is now effectively independent, with its own elected parliament and a prime minister, Lajos Batyani. But not everyone wants to be part of the new Hungary. Savage ethnic conflicts break out between Hungarians and Romanians in Transylvania and Hungarian. That's what I was going to say is this can go forever. I mean, you can get to where everybody fights everybody for, you know, until everything is broken up by almost city, you know, because every state is going to have people in it that want something different or disagree with something. And so this type of, of fighting, it's like, yes, the Hungarians won out of Austrian, you know, the, the thumb of the Austrians, so they get their kingdom. Well... Then there's, there's groups within the Kingdom of Hungary that are looking around and are like, well, we don't want to be under the thumb of the Hungarians. You could literally just do this over and over and over and over again. So eventually, there has to be a line drawn. There has to be a line in the sand somewhere. ...and Serbs in Vojvodina, leaving thousands dead. An even greater threat is Croatian General Josip Jelacic, a fire-breathing imperial loyalist who takes matters into his own hands and invades what he regards as a renegade province. The emperor still hopes for a peaceful resolution and sends a loyal general, Count Lamberg, to take command of Hungarian military forces. But on arrival, he's brutally murdered by a mob. God. Appalled, the imperial government declares war on the Hungarian revolutionaries. This, in turn, outrages liberals and radicals in Vienna. There is fresh violence on the streets, and the Austrian Minister of War is lynched. Troops evacuate the city, while the Emperor flees to Olmutz. God, it is a miracle that Europe didn't break into, you know, a, a bigger version of the Holy Roman Empire after this. Jelicic marches to the government's aid. He joins forces with Windisch Greats outside Vienna, and together they bombard the city. Then they attack. The October Rising is crushed, with the loss of 2,000 lives. 25 revolutionary leaders are executed, including Robert Blum, a member of the German parliament in Frankfurt he becomes a celebrated martyr of the revolutions. With Vienna secure, the Austrian invasion of Hungary can begin. The Hungarians are heavily outnumbered. Budapest falls, and the Hungarian government evacuates to Debrecen. How 
Robert von Moltke. Following the violence in Berlin that March, the King of I feel like he's gonna turn into somebody. Prussia withdraws to his palace at Potsdam, on the outskirts of the city. Here he is surrounded by loyal troops and conservative advisors, including a 33-year-old aristocrat named Otto von Bismarck. Who's a die-hard, die-hard uh, conservative. He is, he truly, truly is a true believer in the power of the monarchy. When asked for his view on what should be done, Bismarck says nothing, but leans over to a piano and taps out the march of the Prussian infantry. The forces of conservatism are strong in Prussia. There is deep loyalty to the state and the king. Yep. Allies, like Bismarck, adopt the enemy's tactics, launching conservative political organizations and newspapers to mobilize this support. By November, King Frederick William has noted the infighting of his opponents, and the defeat of the Vienna Revolution, and decides to act. He orders General Wrangel to lead 13,000 troops into Berlin. They enter the city unopposed, and order the Prussian assembly to disperse. It has no option but to comply. Prussia will get its constitution, but it is one handed down by the king, under which he retains full executive power. Prussian dreams of a true parliamentary system, even a republic, are dashed. In December, two new players take the stage, who will play key roles in shaping the fate of Europe's revolutions. In Vienna, Emperor Ferdinand abdicates in favour of his 18-year-old nephew, Franz Josef. He will reign until his death in 1916. He's the Archduke of, I mean, God, sorry. He is the uncle of the Archduke who is killed to start World War I. In Paris, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, nephew of Emperor Napoleon, is elected President of the French Republic in a landslide victory. He promises to heal divisions, impose order, and restore France to her former glory. By making myself emperor. In Italy, the tumult continues into 1849. In the Papal States, the reforms of Pope Pius had seen him held up as an unlikely liberal role model. But escalating radicalism and violence, notably the assassination of his justice minister, Pellegrino Rossi, caused Pope Pius to flee Rome. In his absence, a Roman Republic is declared. It is led by Giuseppe Mazzini, the iconic figurehead of Italian nationalism, who's devoted his life to the unification of his homeland. But elsewhere, the Italian cause fares badly. Carlo Alberto resumes his war with Austria, with disastrous consequences. At the Battle of Novara, Radetzky inflicts another heavy defeat. Carlo Alberto abdicates in favour of his son, Vittorio Emanuele, to avoid a republican revolution. Twelve years later, he'll become the first king of a modern united Italy. In the south, Ferdinand reverts to absolutist rule and sends troops to Sicily who stamp out the revolution. Then, to the dismay of liberals across Europe, French President Louis Napoleon sends troops to crush the Republic of Rome and put the Pope back on his throne. He has decided the support of French Catholics is more important to him than the fate of Italian Republicans. French forces are led by General Oudinot, son of the famous Marshal. Rome's defenders are led by Garibaldi. But despite skilled and courageous resistance, Rome is forced to surrender after a two-month siege. That summer, Radetzky also retakes Venice, 
and puts an end to its republic. In March, the German National Parliament in Frankfurt had finally agreed on a constitution for a united Germany. It is to be a constitutional monarchy under an emperor. The man intended to play this role is Frederick William of Prussia. So when he declines the offer, the plan is killed stone dead. In public, he says it is impossible without the consent of the other German princes. In private, he says he would never accept a crown from the gutter, disgraced by the stink of revolution. Revolts in support of the national constitution break out in Saxony, the Palatinate and the Grand Duchy of Baden. They are crushed by local forces, assisted by Prussian troops. The Frankfurt parliament itself is dissolved. What hope there had been for a united Germany under a liberal constitution lies in ruins. And it's be it's you have this in in Germany. Obviously, there's not a unified Germany yet, but in the German states, there's this specific issue that you run into where even the conservatives that are nationalists that want a unified Germany. They do not want it under the pretext of a constitution. Well, of course, on the liberal side, that's the whole point of it. They, they have to get the constitution with it. And so you have this, this thing where both sides kind of want the same thing, but absolutely do not want to do it in the same way. Otto von Bismarck's going to get a little bit older here, and then he's going to take control of that situation. But... It's, it's interesting how, you know, the nationalists don't necessarily disagree with the end result, just what exactly it will look like is different. In Austria, the new emperor, Franz Josef, issues his own new constitution, God, reclaiming so almost all political power. He also revokes all the liberal reforms passed by the Hungarian parliament known as the April Laws. I am so used to seeing him as an old bastard in World War I. He is so young there. In response, Lajos Kossuth declares formal Hungarian independence, and the country begins an extraordinary campaign of military mobilization. Hungarian commander General Gergely retakes Budapest, he then launches a bloody assault on Buda Castle, overpowering its Austrian garrison. In desperation, the Austrian Emperor travels to Warsaw to formally request military aid from the Emperor of Russia. You bet. Russian troops have already moved into Moldavia and yep. then Wallachia to put down the Romanian liberal revolution. Yeah, the Russians want nothing to do with this liberal nonsense. They're ready to come in and, and crack skulls. Nicholas now agrees to send troops to Hungary to crush those he describes as the enemies of order and tranquility. Hungary faces an impossible strategic situation, surrounded and outnumbered more than two to one. The combined onslaught is irresistible. The Hungarian forces are driven south and finally forced to surrender. In the aftermath, around 120 Hungarian politicians and army officers are executed. Jesus. So ends Hungary's War of Independence. Very interesting how, you know, Nobody wants the bloodshed, the, the monarchs, none of the crowns want to use a, the type of violence that would be needed to put down these revolutions. But then as time goes on and the revolutions, you know, make further demands and further demands and further demands, then eventually there's a, a point of no return where they, they say, okay, nope, we're not, we're not doing this. We're putting our foot down. We will absolutely crush it. And Russia is, you know, they want nothing to do with, with 
this sort of stuff, this democracy and, and all that. They were not about it at this time period. Eighteen forty eight was a year like no other. A series of seismic political events following one upon another like falling dominoes. But what had been achieved? A British historian famously described 1848 as the turning point at which modern history failed to turn. That's a good quote. And even France, France, which really was, you know, the one that could really do it, they get suckered back into to Napoleon, the, you know, the lesser man. They, France really had a chance at something here. And for all the euphoria of Europe's springtime of the peoples, by 1849, it seemed that the counter-revolutionaries had won everywhere. But some gains did endure, such as the abolition of serfdom in Austria and the popular vote in France, though France became a little less democratic in 1852, after Louis Napoleon made himself emperor. Across Europe, governments modernized and paid more attention to economic and social issues, partly in response to the new challenges that had emerged from socialist and working class politics. The causes of German and Italian unification had been defeated, but made giant strides and learned crucial lessons. Their goals would not be achieved by ideas alone, but the realities of force. In the words of Bismarck, the great questions of the day were to be settled not through speeches and iron majority and decisions, but by iron and blood. God, Bismarck's quotes are awesome. It would be wars waged by powerful monarchies that united Germany and Italy. The legacy of 1848, for good and ill, would be felt for decades to come. Man, that was so good. Um, epic history is, is th their videos are so good. And, and you hear them say that Europe is, you know, this forces Europe to kind of modernize and become at least somewhat more liberal but remember, Russia does not, like, they are not about this at all. And they're really going to run into some problems down the road because they are not modernizing, because they are not moving in that direction at all. They, you know, I, I just wanted to point out that Russia is not a part of the group doing that. Really great video. Um, I will get the next part of the Swedish Ranger series out tomorrow. As always, like, comment, subscribe. Help me keep building the channel over here, and I'll see you all next time.